This is In The Loop. I'm Christian Bryant. If this is your first time watching the show, we've been waiting on you. Seriously, where have you been? We were gonna get started without you. Anyway, here's what we got for y'all. The US is seeing a historic spike in violent crime. We'll take a look at some of the contributing factors in how communities are responding. Plus, pop star Britney Spears is planning to speak to a court about her conservatorship for the first time in more than two years. We'll tell you more about the movement that has sprung up to support reinstating the singer's agency. But first, here's what you need to know right now. Today, the White House announced 70% of Americans 30 and older have received at least one vaccine dose. And if you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that wasn't the original 4th of July vaccination goal, you are correct. The slowdown in daily vaccines given made it pretty clear that wasn't going to happen. So I guess they had to find another accomplishment to highlight. It's like a fallback mission accomplished. We don't see it exactly like something went wrong. Uh, how we see it is we set a bold, ambitious goal, something the president has done from the very beginning. And uh, we are expected to meet that goal uh, just a couple weeks after July 4th. One thing the new data did reveal, the 18 to 26 age group is the least likely to get a vaccine even when it's available to them. So the Biden administration says it's going to double back on efforts to reach those adults. It comes as experts predict the Delta variant will be the dominant strain in the US in a few weeks. Cases of it have already shown up in nearly every state and a new study by scientists at Helix reveal it's growing faster in countries with lower vaccination rates. It's more important than ever to get vaccinated now to stop the chain of infection, the chain of mutations that could lead to a more dangerous variant. Other parts of the world that have had a slower vaccine rollout have also struggled with additional COVID-19 surges. This week, South America became the latest COVID hotspot. Of the 10 countries around the world with the highest daily death rates per capita, seven of those are currently in South America. There are, of course, other factors which have contributed to this, including a weak healthcare system, lack of safety precautions from the government, and, of course, more contagious variants. A new attempt to crack down on big tech today, this one coming from the European Union. We opened today a formal antitrust investigation to assess whether Google has violated our EU competition rules. Regulators there will specifically look into Google's online display ads, which are the banners and text ads that show up on websites. The EU Commission estimates those ads bring in nearly $24 billion a year in revenue for the company. Google is expected to take in about 29% of digital ad spending globally in 2021. Regulators there also want to see if the search engine is unfairly limiting user data to its competitors. Google is already facing several antitrust cases in the US, including one brought by the federal government, which accuses the company of operating an illegal monopoly in markets for online search and search advertising. As the country continues emerging from the pandemic, U.S. cities are confronted with another major issue, violent crime. And despite decades of decreasing crime, some cities are experiencing a historic spike. Newsy's Jamal Andrus talked to experts who say there is no one reason for the increase. Despite nationwide lockdowns, cities across the country saw homicides skyrocket in 2020 a 55% jump in Chicago, a 36% jump in LA, and a nearly 45% rise in New York City. Now, at the midway point of 2021, things have only gotten worse. Are you worried about the rest of the summer? Well, yes, I am. Uh, I, think, I think the direction in which the violence is moving in now, I'm definitely concerned. June 15th was the deadliest day of the year in Chicago so far with eight murders in less than 24 hours, four of which came in one shooting incident. Compared to 2019, shootings and murders are up 56 and 29% respectively. Tony Salam works for the violence prevention organization Ready, specifically doing outreach in Inglewood, the South Side neighborhood where the mass shooting took place. Well, during COVID, we lost about three participants, I believe. I think the last time it's been about 
four months. This spike in violence is nationwide and has impacted cities that had made significant progress in combating gun violence. Cities like New York and Oakland, California, that saw significant drops in violence over the last decade, saw much of that work vanish in 2020 and 2021. New York is on pace to have an 18% rise in murders this year compared to last year. That's following a 45% rise in 2020. In Oakland, 15 people were killed in the month of January alone. Over the weekend, six people were shot and one person was killed at a Juneteenth gathering. While criminologists have lots of theories for why violence has picked up so significantly, ranging from the pandemic to policing to a massive increase in gun sales, no one has been able to pinpoint with any certainty a cause for the spike. One of the greatest predictors um, of, of violence in the future is exposure to violence. Fatima Loren Dreyer has worked with and studied hospital-based violence intervention programs across the country and says the pandemic's extraordinary impact on community-based violence intervention is partly to blame. Oakland saw a 50% reduction in shootings over a seven-year period before the pandemic. Local police largely credited their partnership with these organizations for that drop in violence. These are the sorts of uh, programming that actually transforms communities because of the nature, the cyclical nature of violence. You can tap into that network, identify those who are at high risk, provide wraparound care and continue to monitor them in the long term, you see uh, incredible transformation. Violence intervention programs rely heavily on in-person interactions and community-based relationships. Tony Salam in Chicago says despite their best efforts, they lost touch with some of their participants when the pandemic hit. Outreach workers will go out, show them how to work the, 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 the smartphone to get on Zoom. Uh, and to use the tablets. And so that increased our numbers. I mean, we, we started seeing an increase, but there was a, a drop off, absolutely. President Biden's infrastructure plan features $5 billion worth of funding for these programs nationwide over an eight year period. The president is planning to detail his administration's crime prevention strategy Wednesday. Jamal Andrus, Newsy, Chicago. For the first time in more than two years, Britney Spears is speaking in court about her conservatorship. Britney Spears has been challenging her conservatorship, which is an arrangement where a court puts somebody else in charge of another person's affairs for years. In that time, a movement using the hashtag Free Britney has sprung up to support her. A New York Times documentary and podcasts like Britney's Graham have given the hashtag even more attention recently. Ahead of the pop star's conservatorship hearing Wednesday, Newsy's Casey Mendoza spoke to some of Spears' biggest supporters. Free Britney is the rallying cry for fans and advocates of Britney Spears. On April 22nd, 2019, I was one of the first people to get to the Britney Spears uh, rally, I guess you could say. When I was a part of the very first one, there was literally a handful of us. I was so nervous. I was like, they're gonna literally think I'm crazy. These are people who actually care about her. The pop star has been under a strict conservatorship since 2008, after concerns were raised about her mental and physical well-being. The conservatorship restricts Spears' ability to make her own business deals, medical decisions, and even see her sons. And that's one of the things that I think hits me the most is just that her like motherhood has just been ripped away. We're talking about going on years and years and years and years now. Homegirl wants to do her thing. And so the Free Britney movement was born as a small group of concerned fans. Free Britney first was mentioned on the internet, I would say, in 2009, shortly after Britney's conservatorship became permanent. I made a homemade t-shirt that said Free Britney that I staged a little mini protest. The movement soon grew and went viral on social media, propelled by podcasts like Britney's Graham, worried comments on the pop star's Instagram posts, and concerned videos on TikTok. She wants us to hear her, you guys. The first time that it started going mainstream a little bit was in July 2020 when it kind of exploded on TikTok. I was like, oh my gosh, we're getting so much momentum. And then Framing Britney Spears just 
launched us into a whole different world. Sometimes we'll have parades that go through my campus and everything, and I'll take the tapestry out and I'll like hold it in front of people and stuff. The pop star's father, Jamie Spears, has called the Free Britney movement a joke made up of conspiracy theorists. But that hasn't stopped other high-profile celebrities like Miley Cyrus, Paris Hilton, and Sarah Jessica Parker from lending their support. It feels good that people are recognizing that this is a messed up situation. I definitely think the public pressure and the Free Britney movement of it all has shuffled the deck. Spears's conservatorship is still heavily shrouded in mandatory secrecy. Spears has said in a court filing that it rescued her from a collapse. But in a court record obtained by the New York Times, an investigator also wrote she articulated she feels the conservatorship has become an oppressive and controlling tool against her. Now, the pop star is fighting to remove her father from having a say in controlling her fortune, estimated at nearly $60 million, and possibly going as far as terminating the system entirely. On June 23rd, she is speaking for the first time in two years in front of a judge. I hope that we're giving her courage to say what she wants to say. Only she knows what her reality is. So I hope that she presents herself in the best way. And I hope that what she wants for herself and what is best happens for her. Keith Mendoza, Newsy, Chicago. It's halftime for ITL. We'll give you a quick break to check your phone, assuming you haven't been second screening already. We'll see you back here in a second. About one in four COVID-19 patients will develop long haul symptoms lasting for months. Doctors on the front lines treating long haulers say not enough information is out there for them. Newsy's Lindsay Thies went to one of the first comprehensive COVID centers in the U.S. to learn more. Today is day 464. 38-year-old Patrick Maley is coming off of a Father's Day that's been flanked by months of long-haul COVID symptoms. My five-year-old especially, he worries, his biggest concern is that daddy's gonna die. The change from healthy to chronically unhealthy is scary. Long-haul COVID is associated with a higher risk of death. And like so many, Malia just wants to get back to something close to normal. His days went from running between two jobs, going to school and keeping up with two young kids, to chest pains, shortness of breath, and sleeping for 14 to 16 hours at a time. Nobody talked to me about scheduling the CT or the ultrasound yet. Finding out why he's not getting better has been a struggle. I've seen every kind of specialist imaginable, and everybody's like, I don't know what to do with you. So that's that's been the hard part. We really haven't focused a lot of the medications and care on this long haul population. Dr. Charles Davidson oversees the comprehensive COVID-19 center at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in downtown Chicago, the second in the U.S. It opened in December of 2020. So far, they've seen more than 1,100 patients and hundreds more are trying to get in. Right now, it takes one to three months to get an appointment. Talk to me a little bit about the patients that this clinic is seeing now. Only about 14, 15 percent have actually been hospitalized. Two thirds are women and the average age is less than 50. What makes these comprehensive clinics different? Here a patient gets assessed and their case reviewed by an entire team of specialists depending on their symptoms from lungs to brain, heart to kidney, blood to mental health. But comprehensive COVID centers like this one at Northwestern Memorial in Chicago are rare. We believe there's about 40 centers like this around right now. It's, it's, I think it's difficult for patients actually to find these centers. There's a lot of places that pop up, but many of those have a, they have a pulmonary clinic or they have a neurology clinic, but not necessarily are they working together. Standards of care for long haul COVID patients are definitely lacking at this point because we know so little. Your CT scan, what we're looking at. Pulmonologist Dr. Mark Sala sees patients like Patrick Malia. Okay. okay. He says the most common symptoms he's seen, chest pain, shortness of breath, general fatigue, brain fog, lasting sometimes nine months or longer. His biggest frustrations, that he can't give better answers. Anything we didn't address. Um, right now, all they can do is look at the symptoms and patterns in patients and try drugs typically used for other illnesses for that. And there's lots of tests. Take some deep breaths in and out through your mouth. To make sure that there's not something underlying and worse. The big thing here. I mean, you sound really clear. So let patients know to be patient. There is hope out there that 
individuals who have long COVID will feel better. For a lot of people, that's taking a very long time. Um, however, I don't have a lot of patients who aren't getting any better, and that gives me a lot of hope. For Malia, it's made all the difference. He knows there's a lengthy road ahead, but now knowing that, he's got some newfound optimism. I've gotten good information. I've gotten uh, a plan of action, things like that, and that's really helps. Lindsay Thies, Newsy, Chicago. And have some name of the yes. Despite the incentives like lotteries, college scholarships, and tickets to sporting events, some parts of the country still have extremely low vaccination rates, particularly in parts of the South and West. National reporter Maya Rodriguez digs into what's driving vaccine hesitancy in those regions. Off of a busy main road, as people roll up to a gas station, there's an all-out effort to get them to roll up their sleeves. We've been all across, all across the state. Taurus Johnson is a community health worker in Laplace, Louisiana, a state where vaccine hesitancy is all too real. There's still a lot of myths out there uh, about about the vaccine, about, you know, it's not a good thing and it hasn't been tested enough. It's a hard sell. Officials say a general distrust of government may be partly to blame, along with a higher number of rural communities and a combination of lower educational and income levels. According to the U.S. Census, about 20 percent of the people in Louisiana live below the poverty line, the second highest in all the nation. Now, officials there are trying to sell residents on the vaccine, literally, with money. Here in Louisiana, they're trying all kinds of incentives to get people to get the COVID vaccine, from free entry into state parks to $100,000 being given away every week and a grand prize of a million dollars. Still, it's an uphill battle. And it's not just in Louisiana. In parts of the West, but mainly in the South, states are lagging in their vaccination numbers. Those with the lowest percentages of people who've received one dose include Mississippi, Louisiana, Wyoming, Alabama, and Idaho. The numbers are even more dismal when it comes to how many people are fully vaccinated against COVID, with many of those same states showing only a third or less of their residents are fully vaccinated. Those low numbers are putting a damper on the country's overall COVID vaccine rate, and that's casting real doubt the U.S. will reach President Biden's goal of getting 70 percent of people at least one dose by the 4th of July. Officials are already looking beyond that date. We're going to continue to push vaccination beyond the 4th of July into the summer, so get as many people vaccinated as we possibly can. For Taurus Johnson, that will likely mean more on the ground vaccine efforts like this one. It's just going to take uh, all of our efforts, all of our combined efforts until we can until we finally get a handle on this thing. So, you know, although we're not quite where we want to be, we're getting there. A team effort required from every state in the war against COVID. So, you know, we're still fighting an uphill battle, but we're still fighting a good fight. In Laplace, Louisiana, I'm Maya Rodriguez. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Tell me about how you're liking the show or how you like your most recent haircut. I am really, really good at gassing people up. The live music scene is finally starting to come back, but performance venues aren't out of the woods just yet. A lot of them had no option but to temporarily shut down during the pandemic since they weren't exactly hosting any gigs. They lost out on a lot of revenue and many are still desperately waiting for funding they've been promised by Congress. National reporter Chris Conti looks into why that money isn't getting to them. Shuttered stages across the country slowly starting to come back to life. Just to watch him. But Chris Cobb is still looking at a lot of silence. Once the money's gone, we close. And can just get closer every day. He's the owner of Exit Inn in Nashville, a small independent music venue that's lost more than 90% of their revenue in the last 15 months. We're on the edge of a cliff with a huge number of venues right there at the edge, and they're about to go over, and they won't come back. Chris thought he'd be getting some much-needed help from Congress. 
help that was promised back in December, but it's still silent here. It's, it's been exhausting, in all honesty. Audrey Fix Schaefer is with the National Independent Venue Association. As COVID forced the closure of thousands of music venues across the country, this nonprofit began lobbying Congress hard for help, and they got it in the form of $16 billion in stimulus aid. But there's a problem. Almost six months from the passage of the legislation, and still the vast majority of our members haven't seen a dime from the $16 billion emergency relief program. More than 14,000 performance venues across the country have applied for that stimulus aid. Only 90 of them have gotten any money. It's not COVID that's keeping us closed now. It's the fact that the funding hasn't flowed, which is keeping us closed now. And it's, um, it shouldn't be like this. The Small Business Administration is supposed to be administering the grants. Website errors, though, have plagued the process with trouble. But venues need that money to help hire back staff, place down payments on booking bans. Many can't reopen without it. This industry can't flip on and flip off like a light switch, unfortunately. There's a reason Congress was so eager to help. 12 million people across the country have jobs tied to live events. For every $1 spent on a ticket at small venues, a total of $12 in economic activity is generated within communities, on restaurants, hotels, taxis, and retail establishments. For so many of the, the venues and promoters, it is, it's demoralizing. It's frightening because they've exhausted all of the funds that they did have. And living with the shades pulled Even as Americans begin to return to shuttered stages across the country, not all of them are getting the help they were promised. I'm Chris Conti. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from news are headed your way right now.